Hello, my name is Craig Shufton and today I would like to talk to you a little bit about the future. Now obviously I'm not actually going to tell you what's going to happen in the future. I'm going to tell you some stories about how artists and musicians have imagined the future at various times over the past hundred years and what role they thought that they and their work might play in shaping and creating that future. So these are all stories about things that have already happened or are happening now. But I guess this talk is still kind of futuristic because of course we are now in the, in the fortunate position of living in the future imagined by these people, these artists, which means that we can look back at the hopes they had for their art, what they thought it would do in their future, you know, 20 or 30 or sometimes even 50 years later and see how it worked out, see whether their predictions were right or wrong. We'll try not to be too smug about it because nobody likes a smart ass, but it's hard sometimes. They don't make it easy. Um, for instance, in 1986, the, the hard rock singer David Lee Roth left his group Van Halen at what seemed like the, the peak of the band's success. They had many hits, including Jump, which is a lot of people still love today. Um, so he left and, uh, and everybody wanted to know why. They said, Diamond Dave, why did you leave Van Halen? And, uh, and he said in a, an interview with MTV, what makes you think I left? The way he saw it, he hadn't left the band at all. He said, uh, here's a little met metaphysics for you. Perhaps it was they who moved away from me by standing still. I think this is a great image and this is the image that David Lee Roth uses to explain how time works for rock artists. He says it's like standing on an escalator or one of those kind of flat people movers like they have at the airport, except that you're facing in the opposite direction. So the floor is moving backwards and, uh, and you have to walk or, or sometimes even run just to stay in the same place. If you stand still, you will go backwards. So, you know, to, this is the, the, the metaphor that he's using to explain how music works. It's not enough just to be a shit hot guitar player, you know, to write awesome um, hard rock party anthems and keep on doing it. You've got to do something new. And that's what happened to the band. Eddie and Alex and the other guy uh, stayed with the comfortable and familiar formula of Van Halen and, uh, and they quickly disappeared into the past. They were already disappearing. Diamond Dave was prepared to put one foot in front of the other and face the future. You know, according to him, this would ensure that he remained contemporary into the 90s and beyond. They probably should have known better, those Van Halen guys, because the floor had been moving for quite some time before they came on the scene, since at least the end of the 19th century, I would say. In fact, at the very end of the 19th century, in 1899, uh, the Austrian composer Arnold Schoenberg wrote a piece of music called Verklärte Nacht, uh, which was in what you might call a late romantic style. It was done under the influence of Wagner, who was very popular at the time. Um, it would have appealed to people who liked composers like Mahler and that sort of thing. It was, it was of its time, it was contemporary. And, uh, and it was, you know, it was a little bit, a little bit complex and, you know, and not entirely familiar to people, but it was also embraced by critics and by uh, the music, music going public. Um, and Schoenberg probably could have continued like that, you know, he could have written 12 more things a bit like Verklärte Nacht and his reputation would have grown and, uh, and the size of his audience too. Um, but he didn't do that. Uh, shortly after, he came up with this new way of composing which he called atonal music, which to most people sounded horrible. Um, and even the people who did, the very few people who did appreciate it, I think were probably secretly wishing that he would occasionally go back to the, to the earlier style of Verklärte Nacht and just do something pretty once in a while. Sometimes I think reading Schoenberg's essays from that time, which are excellent, uh, that even he would have preferred if he could go back to, to the earlier style of Verklärte Nacht and write something pretty. Um, but he knew that he couldn't because, as he explained in, in, uh, in his essays and letters, he felt or he, he knew that he had a job, a responsibility, uh, and that was that he had to develop his ideas for the sake of music's future. Schoenberg understood that the middle class public wanted to be soothed or entertained by things that sounded familiar, things that sounded like Mahler or Wagner or like his own earlier work. But he didn't think of himself as an entertainer. He wasn't, it wasn't his business to, to soothe or reassure people. He thought of himself as an artist and he knew or believed that the artist's job was to tell the truth. That's why uh, the poet Baudelaire liked to say that the painter of modern life had a duty to paint the metropolis, to paint the, the great stone canyons of modern cities, to paint the crowds. Uh, it, it might be ugly, but that's what, the, what, what they've got to do, no matter, you know, no matter how much their patrons or their audience might want to see classical subjects or nice pastoral scenes. That's not what modern art is about. That's why Schoenberg's friends in the Vienna Secession movement had a, a picture of a woman holding up a mirror to the viewer as their logo. The artist, 
they, they believed, must show the modern world its true face. And if you don't like it, you know, if you, the, the critic or the audience, don't like it, that's not because the, the artist has made bad art. It's because you're frightened by, by the future. You're frightened by urbanization and industrialization and the masses and all that stuff. And you would prefer to take comfort in the familiar, in the rural past. Too bad. That's right. Modern art thinks you're chicken. This is probably the only field of endeavor in which artists get to out-tough everybody else and they really make the most of it. Uh, I would say that the futurists perfected this kind of temporal machismo with their famous manifesto of 1909, where their leader, the poet F.T. Marinetti, famously said that he preferred electric light to moonlight. Uh, later on, they did a manifesto of music um, where they insisted that the sound of backfiring cars was preferable to the sound of violins in an orchestra. Marinetti also said that he was looking forward to the Great War that everyone else was so terrified of uh, because he thought it would provide many new opportunities for poetic beauty, uh, you know, from the sound of machine guns and explosions and things like that. He thought that that would be great. Marinetti's gamble was that the future would be more violent, more technological and less human than the past. And this was a pretty safe bet in 1909. It was still a pretty safe bet in 1963 when Andy Warhol painted soup cans and electric chairs and said that he aspired to be a robot. Or in the year 2000 when Radiohead temporarily abandoned songs and guitar strings for laptops and vocoders. They did this because they were trying to express a sense of profound anxiety about the millennium, about the future. And singer Tom York knew that the band had no hope of expressing the feeling of moving into the 21st century using the technology of the 19th century. So all those rock radio listeners who loved OK Computer might not like it, but Radiohead knew they had something more important to do than be likable, and so the U2 fans would just have to suck it up. Today, this little standoff between artists and audiences continues. The future is still terrifying. I'm terrified by it. I wake up in the morning and I read about uh, in imminent environmental doom and drone attacks and NSA surveillance and the corporatization of public life and I feel very very scared um, and when I'm starting to feel like that I, I, I feel like putting on that nice new Haim album because the tunes are good and it makes me want to dance but mostly because it sounds like the the radio hits of the 70s and 80s that I used to hear when I was a kid and have loved ever since but when I do this, I'm doing it wrong. And I know this because I read articles like, uh, like the one by music writer Adam Harper in Electronic Beats, um, where he points out, quite rightly, I think, that all those nice harmonies and warm guitars and whatnot are really just a nostalgic screen to hide the reality of the present, which he reasonably assumes is also the reality of the future. He praises artists like Heatsick and Egyptrix because their work makes him think of hovering robot drones attacking refugees, fleeing from some future environmental catastrophe or techno-apocalypse. He admits that this willingness to embrace the cold, dark future is a new version of Marinetti's futurism, but instead he uses the term accelerationism, which I think is even better. It's such a great image of artists and musicians stepping on the gas, figuratively speaking, so as to get to the future before anyone else. And as they push the pedal to the metal, I imagine them doing it with that same mixture of haste and resignation that we, uh, we all feel when we're trying to get to work or to an appointment of some kind. It's not that we're looking forward to it exactly, we just don't want to be late. To stand still is to be left behind. If you want to keep up, you have to go faster. <laughs>